I'm Eileen Fiegel. I'm the director of the Institute for Comprehensive Community Development. The afternoon session, we're going to build on what we talked about this morning, but then put it into the context of the Chicago metropolitan region. And to help set that context, we have Marwa Joy Zodi, who was uh, the project manager in the development of the plan for economic growth and jobs which was recently released by World Business Chicago. And Marwa is going to come up and give us an overview of what that, what that plan says in terms of regional opportunities for growth, and then also how we might link the low-income communities throughout the Chicago area so that they benefit from that growth. Marwa? Thanks very much, Eileen, and uh, everyone here at the Fed. It's really exciting to be here. Um, I should say I'm, uh, I'm really uh, here on behalf of uh, Rita Athos, the president of World Business Chicago, Michael Sachs, the vice chairman, um, and Mayor Rahm Emanuel, the chairman, um, as well as a pretty incredible leadership team and group of professional staff who uh, put this together. Um, so first, just a quick question, and I'll keep the overview brief, because I think the meat will be in the good conversation afterward. Um, quick question, who has heard about or already read uh, this plan for economic growth for Chicago? Great, good, a decent, decent mix in the room, that's exciting. Good, so I'll start with some uh, very brief context here um, on uh, sort of the need for this plan in Chicago and in our metro area. May 16th, 2011, does anybody remember that date? The significance of that date? It's the day that uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel took office last year. Um, and so very quickly after the mayor took office, um, he sort of looked around and said, what is the overarching economic growth plan for the region? And uh, as uh, Michael Sachs, the vice chair, likes to say, it was a situation where you, know, you could ask 10 people and potentially get 10 different answers. Um, so there was a real need for you know, an overarching set of strategies that everyone could talk about and speak, to, speak the same language on around the region. Also, um, in August of last year, the Chicago uh, TIF reform panel called for the creation of a similar set of strategies to guide and drive uh, TIF allocation for economic growth investments. Um, and so, in September of last year, Mayor Emanuel called for the creation of a comprehensive and inclusive plan for Chicago's economic growth. Um, he tasked World Business Chicago as the economic development arm of the city to lead the effort. And uh, the folks at World Business Chicago put together a diverse and inclusive steering committee, which was a pretty critical piece of the criterion from the mayor. Um, so you can see the steering committee here. The effort was uh, led by three co-chairs from World Business Chicago, um, Tony Anderson, Michael Sachs, and Glenn Tilton. We had uh, Deputy Mayor Mark Engelson involved, uh, ex officio. Um, and you can see the steering committee here was truly a diverse group of representation from labor, from business groups, um, foundations, and also neighborhood groups, very importantly. Um, we also had a professional leadership team, uh, including a team from McKinsey, which is where I originally hail from, um, as well as uh, the Brookings Institution, um, RW Ventures, I'm sure everybody knows Bob Weisbord in the room, um, and Metropolis Strategies uh, as well. So I'll start with some guiding principles, and this was truly something that the steering committee aligned on even before we pushed on any analysis and figuring out strategies for growth. We all agreed that we needed this plan to be truly fact-based and practical. Um, we wanted to make sure the plan was beneficial to all sections of society, and so this is probably the guiding principle that really resonates the most in this room. Um, even before you know, we started talking about strategies, there was this guiding, uh, overarching theme that this had to lift up growth for all of Chicago. Not just the loop, not just the north side, not just the south side, not just uh, certain classes or races or neighborhoods, but all of the region. Um, and this was also Chicago-focused looking outward. So at the end of the day, this was um, led by and announced by Mayor Emanuel and the city of Chicago, but the real focus was of, for the whole metropolitan area, so the 14-county area here in Chicago. Um, so all of our analyses were based on the metro area. Um, and all of the uh, kind of principles looked at the entire metropolitan area because that's really our unit of economic growth. <clears throat> and very importantly, we wanted to make sure it was a living, breathing strategy. So this is not something where you know, we wanted to publish a plan, put it on a shelf, make it look nice, and then never come back to it. This truly is a living and breathing uh, set of strategies. And as, uh, as the mayor often says, 
his, his line on you know, strong schools, safe streets, and stable finances. All of these are critical preconditions to economic growth, and so we openly acknowledge that at the beginning as well. Um, another point, this plan truly focuses on economic growth, but in, it in no way diminishes the need for other parts of economic development, right? So poverty alleviation, public health, housing, all of those components are, again, critical preconditions to economic growth, but we really focus the strategies on growing the regional economy. So I'll go through uh, some of these pages pretty quickly. We started by defining five explicit goals. Um, we wanted to make sure that we developed a set of strategies that would ultimately accelerate growth in GRP, our growth, gross regional product, uh, employment, productivity, income, and wages. And so again, we were very specifically focused on those top line economic growth measures. We applied a framework of five market levers to the analysis and to thinking about potential strategies. Um, you can see it here. This uh, builds from the work that the Brookings Institution does in many other metropolitan areas around the country. And these five are really drivers of economic growth that work together in an interplay. Um, so there's a ton of you know, very explicit overlap here. The five are um, economic sectors and clusters, which we talked about a little bit this morning, um, human capital, and this doesn't just include uh, production and retention of human capital, but also, importantly, most efficiently matching people to the right jobs. Number three is innovation and entrepreneurship. And this uh, doesn't just include um, startups and sort of the fancy startups, but all of entrepreneurship and small business growth in the region, um, as well as innovation in our larger companies, so things like patent growth. Uh, number four is physical and virtual infrastructure. And so we wanted to make sure that when we talk about infrastructure, we're not just talking about the linkages of people and goods, but also information, so the whole virtual piece. Um, and number five is public and civic institutions. So this is really kind of the context in which our people and businesses reside. Um, it includes everything from uh, government efficiency to the business environment, um, the value proposition that businesses get from taxes and that sort of thing. So uh, we ran through a good, you know, hundreds of pages of analysis that fortunately I won't be going through here. Um, but at the end of the day, what we found is that Chicago starts we're starting this process in a position of real economic strength for Chicago, so that's the good news, right? Chicago is a huge economy as a metro area, um, the third largest in the country, and I always like this uh, stat. If Chicago as a metro area were a country, we would be the 20th largest country in the world uh, economically. Um, we have a very diverse industrial base, and this has shifted uh, significantly in the last couple of decades. So, you know, we don't rely on one or two industries for our entire economy. Um, we have great academic institutions. Of course, historically, we've been a leader in transportation and logistics, and that continues today. So we're really starting from a good place. We have incredible human capital, um, some of it you know, latent that needs to be tapped into better, but we also have a pretty highly educated population compared to most other metro areas in the country. So again, a good place to start. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold, so sniffly a little bit. Um, on the flip side, though, and one thing that I think was really uh, exciting and important about this plan is that the mayor made sure that we were very honest and transparent about the real situation of Chicago's economy. So if we look at the past decade of Chicago's economic growth, it hasn't all been pretty, right? We've seen historically some pretty significant challenges. So I won't go through all the charts on this page, but um, briefly, if you start at the top left chart here, um, the blue lines are Chicago, city and metro, and then the red, uh, which unfortunately you can't see here, but I'll tell you about it, is uh, the US national trend. Um, so if we look at productivity, Chicago historically and today has a higher average productivity than the US national average, um, but the gap is closing. So you know the, the advantage that Chicago has productivity-wise has been kind of slowly shrinking in the last decade, and so it's something to really be aware of and think about for our next decade. Um, in employment, we all know, you know, nationally it was a pretty difficult decade in employment, but Chicago and our metro area saw a much more significant drop in employment than the U.S. average as well. Um, and ultimately, we've seen GRP growth that on average has been at half the rate of the U.S. So this is, a, you know, we have a strong economy, but this is um, really kind of raising a flag to say we've got to start doing things more strategically and differently for the next decade. 
So the analysis and working with uh, something like over 200 stakeholders around the region, both from you know, private sector, from nonprofits, from neighborhoods, all of this came together into a set of 10 transformative strategies. Um, they were importantly fact-based, like we said. We wanted to make sure that the strategies were high impact, so the light was really worth the candle on each of the 10 strategies. And uh, very importantly, we wanted to make sure that they built from Chicago's strengths. To be competitive in the future economy, you really need to build upon what you're good at. And so that was kind of a guiding premise for the strategies. And the idea of these strategies, which I'll go to here, is to really provide an overarching framework and set of north stars, as the mayor says now, um, that guides and uh, sort of enlightens uh, investments and decisions and activities across many different sectors in the region. So you know, we, we want these strategies to be overarching and comprehensive enough that pretty much any organization, either in the private sector or in the nonprofit world, or um, in one neighborhood versus another, can kind of speak the same language. So I'll talk a little bit now, and I hope that in the panel we can talk more about this, um, about how these strategies link to our topic for today, which is how do we better link our low-income neighborhoods and our communities to regional economic growth. Um, so the first thing I'll say is that uh, inclusiveness is really embedded in all the 10 strategies. So it's not like you know we singled out one strategy and said this is going to be the strategy around including our neighborhoods. It really is uh, built into all 10 of them. Um, and I'll just give you some examples. So uh, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, Teresa this morning talked about the importance of um, uh, clusters and strategically growing clusters in a region and how you need to make sure that those clusters actually have a presence in and would lift up our inner city neighborhoods and low income neighborhoods. And so that is, uh, I think, ever present in Chicago. I think we have the, the fortunate situation where, given our diverse economy, most of our kind of high impact or big ticket industry clusters have a strong presence in many of our neighborhoods. Um, so for example, in advanced manufacturing, the strategy is around lifting this entire cluster, including the whole supply chain, right? Not just the big manufacturing companies, but our small suppliers and small companies and so forth. Um, we have a lot of neighborhood-based presence in this sector. So just as one example, uh, around the Austin area, there's a lot of metal work and metal uh, machinery manufacturing. <coughs> um, of course, transportation and logistics has a real kind of geographical center in the region um, around the south side. Uh, food manufacturers are you know, near the west side and in many other locations. So a lot of these kind of cluster strategies do have direct neighborhood implications. Um, tourism and entertainment, so we heard from uh, Maria Rosario Jackson this morning uh, around the importance of arts and culture in our neighborhoods. This is one place where that feeds in directly. There's, I think we'll have more conversation today about how our Chicago uh, cultural neighborhoods can really contribute to tourism and, and the growth of entertainment sectors in the region. Um, on exports, this is an interesting one. So when we talk about exports, especially in Chicago, we're really talking about small and medium-sized uh, businesses because the challenge and the gap is there. Um, so similar to uh, the national situation right now, something like uh, only 5% of our small and medium enterprises export to any country. Um, and of those, roughly 60% export to just one country. So there's a significant opportunity to help our local small businesses access new markets. So you know, the local food manufacturer in, in one of our communities can not only work with customers in that community, but actually access global markets. Um, workforce development is, of course, very neighborhood focused. Um, it's all about bringing the right human capital to where the jobs are. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of kind of neighborhood uh, focus on that one. Um, on innovation, number seven, innovation and entrepreneurship. Again, this is not just about the sexy digital startup company. This is really about all of our small businesses. How can we have more small businesses in our, uh, in our challenged neighborhoods in Chicago? And how can we help them grow faster? Um, infrastructure, again, this is not just about uh, physical infrastructure and connecting people and goods, but also digital or virtual infrastructure. And so this in particular um, has a very good neighborhood angle to it, where some of our communities don't have access to things like broadband, right? And so to really create our next generation infrastructure, there will need to be a focus on those communities. Um, and then uh, I'll jump to number 10 on the environment where business can, businesses can flourish. Again, this is for all of our businesses across all of our communities in the region. 
Um, strategy number nine is a little bit more specific around developing and deploying our neighborhood assets. <coughs> and so a couple comments on this one. Um, this is based on the premise that connecting our neighborhoods and building from the strengths of our neighborhoods is actually critical to our region's economic growth. So um, uh, efficiencies, productivity, innovation, new ideas in the region, all of these come from dense uh, connected networks. And just like people and businesses are units of economic growth, our neighborhoods and our communities are units of economic growth. And so the more we can make those linkages happen, both in terms of people and things, but also ideas, um, the more our whole region grows. And uh, Teresa this morning also talked about uh, the assets in particularly our inner city communities. Um, nationally, this also applies here. So uh, our inner cities have one of the densest and most diverse populations. And so to really tap into that human capital for our whole region's growth is critical. So initiatives, and again, the idea is that the strategies are kind of an overarching framework, and then many, many initiatives would feed into each of those 10 strategies. These are just some examples on the screen, but a lot of what uh, a lot of people in this room are doing every day align directly to those strategies. And so the idea is um, let's accelerate, shine a light on, and launch new initiatives that would together uh, implement the strategies for growth. And uh, just uh, to give you a sense of how we're going forward now that the plan has been published, I think you have a summary in your packets, um, we will actually be keeping the steering committee and the leadership group together in the long term. Um, each strategy will have its own task force of leadership focused on making sure we actually make a difference on that strategy. Um, and we hope that new collaborations, new networks, new connections are formed um, in the context of these strategies to lift up our region's growth. So I'll stop there and I look forward to uh, the discussion on the panel. Thank you. trying to take the <laughs> um, thank you again Marwa for setting that context I want to add one more statement of context and then introduce the panel and that's to reiterate something that Teresa Lynch said this morning which is uh, for the neighborhoods to prosper the region has to be adding jobs and growing economically but just because the region is adding jobs doesn't necessarily mean that the low-income communities within the Chicago area are going to be guaranteed to benefit. So we have to be really intentional and strategic about how those communities are positioned so they do benefit from that growth. And I think it was, um, it was a relief to me to see the language in the plan that really is intentional about that. I think for a lot of the CDCs and other folks working in the neighborhoods throughout Chicago, it's really going to be the devil's going to the details of how that gets implemented. So uh, part of why this panel was selected is because they are doing some very interesting things to position low-income communities to benefit from those opportunities. And I'm going to start with introductions on the right. I'm going to give really brief introductions. The full bios are in your packet. Um, David Baum is the co-founder of Baum Development. And as Jim Caprero mentioned earlier, He's an award-winning commercial and residential development firm and also represents a number of retailers across the country, including Starbucks, FedEx, Kinko's, and Panera Bread. Gloria Castillo is the president of Chicago United, which is an organization that promotes multiracial leadership in business to advance parity and economic opportunity. She's been recognized many times for her advocacy on behalf of minority and women-owned enterprises and has a whole slew of awards that are listed in the bio statement. Uh, to my left is Jackie Samuel. Jackie is the new community's program director for Claritian Associates, and in that position, she leads South Chicago's efforts to coordinate a very holistic approach to neighborhood revitalization as part of LISC's um, NCP program. 
And Jackie has an extensive history in the performing arts, arts education, and administration as well. And then Myra, we've already introduced, and thank you for joining us for the panel. Okay. So I think I'm actually going to start with Jackie. Uh-oh. I, I sort of knew that was going to happen. Um, so as you know, through your work throughout Chicago, many low-income communities, not just in Chicago, but across the country, as Maria said earlier, have all these really wonderful cultural and arts assets. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start by asking you to talk a little bit about not just in South Chicago, but in the other communities you've worked with, mm -hmm. how those have really been used to improve the quality of life for the folks who live there, but also mm -hmm. position the community to attract investment. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me, first of all. And um, I, before I start, just one quick question. I want to ask how many people are in the arts industry in this room? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, just wanted to know. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's an easy task for me because I am an artist. Actually, I thought I was gonna be on Broadway, but when I saw the lack of audiences out there, I just realized something else was really missing. And so some kind of way I ended up in the schools, realized they were taking it out of the schools, and then I ended up in community development, and I saw this disconnect between arts, education, and community development, and I thought, they should be working together. You know, what's happening here? And so uh, my first venture was on the west side of Chicago um, at Bethel New Life. They had fortunately um, acquired a 3.5 acre piece of land in which there was a chapel that was converted into a cultural facility. And um, they had been doing many projects, but they really wanted to sort of take it seriously and see what could really evolve in, in the um, community. And with that, I, you know, we had to really go underground and find those artists and, and bring them out. So first of all, I guess I want to talk about the fact that you really have to identify who's in that community that's creating the arts. Now, they might be there in, in the community, but you might not see them. So you're going to have to make sure you find who those foot soldiers are to go and dig them and bring them out. And until you do that, none of this is going to happen. You have to find who those artists are. And they come in so many different shapes and colors that you, you, you have to find someone who's going to be able to communicate with them. So some of the examples that we did, I would layer some of my programs. For instance, um, I brought in an artist, um, Bernard Williams. He was a um, fantastic painter. Um, one of the things that he created was um, paintings on black cowboys and Native Americans. And I thought, oh, we've got to get you to come and get this exhibit. So my other thought was, now, how am I going to get people to come see this exhibit when they're thinking about, I've got to pay my bills, I've got, I've got to find a job, how am I going to get them interested in that? So I had to look on the level of what's going on in the culture of the community. So when I looked at the community, I said, well, what, do, what does the community cherish the most? Their children. So unfortunately, I found this coalition of black cowboys that are right here in the city of Chicago. They came out and they brought their ponies out. And I said, now, the kids are going to want to come out now because they're going to want to ride those ponies. <laughs> found a coalition of black square dancers was just like line dancing. They came out and they were teaching dancing. So now I'm layering some of the work that I'm doing right now. And when the artists came for that opening um, gala event that we had right in the community, right in the neighborhood, all of a sudden they're dancing around this artist. But the one thing that I'm trying to do is how do I make sure that that art is connecting to the community? At the end of that program, I look and there's this 12-year-old boy looking in amazement at his art and I'm thinking that's where I want to go because that's our future that's our audience and that's where we start with our creative minds so we want to make sure that we keep the arts in our educational system we want to make sure that we look at arts in creative ways and integrate them in every aspect of community development when you come I'm in South Chicago right now 
We're a little rough around the edges, but we're getting there. But you also have to remember it takes time. You have to give the communities time to grow. And that's where, if you came to South Chicago right now, you'll see us in that process. I have 30 very active community artists. I had to reclaim them. I had to get them engaged back in their communities because they were working outside of the community. I think you should also look at the city of Chicago's cultural plan. If you have not attended one of those meetings, you need to attend the last several ones that are coming up in July. And you're going to hear what all the neighborhoods in the city of Chicago said what they want. So they're looking for arts education. They're looking for the arts in their communities. They're looking for those cultural hubs. I can keep going on and on, so you will probably have to stop me, because I see I'm the only opportunity where you really get a chance to have that conversation about someone who understands the arts world and, and believes that it, it, in order for us to really build that quality of life, it has to be in all of our lives in every aspect. I'm going to stop right Great. there. Thanks, Jackie. Um, David, I'm going to go to you next. And I know this morning we talked a little bit about the Green Exchange, but I do want to give you an opportunity to give a little more detail on that and then specifically talk about the efforts to link the jobs that are coming in with the local community. OK. Well, uh, thank you for having me. I was really enjoying listening to Jackie. Um, that, was, that was great. My, my mother is a retired Chicago public school teacher. And she went into Humble Park originally to be an English teacher and found out that they couldn't afford music. Mm -hmm. She also is a pianist and a musician and so ended up doing double duty. Mm -hmm. And she, you would, she would love you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's great. Um, so yeah, we touched a little bit about the Green Exchange this morning. Uh, we tried to do, or we are, we are doing a lot of different things. And uh, there are a number of programs and dozens of groups that got involved in putting this project together, from the city of Chicago to LISC to lead council uh, to some neighborhood groups, um, federal government. I mean, it, it took everybody to get a project done and, and financed in 2009. Um, all of those projects really helped us to provide opportunities to the community. And it happens at a whole bunch of different levels. So taking a vacant building and turning it into an active place of commerce, that's, that's the first thing. Uh, the, the genesis of the project was that there was another developer that wanted to come in when condo mania was going on in 2005, 2006 and make this condos. And the current aldermen and the community group said, no, 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 that's not what we want. We lost 200 manufacturing jobs in the neighborhood. We really want a place of commerce. So they found us and we had done a similar project um, in the, the Motor Road District. And we said, yeah, we think we can do this, and we think we can bring, you know, three, or, three to 500 people could work in this, in this area. Um, ultimately, today, we have 1,100, and we think it'll go up to 1,800 when we're all finished, uh, far exceeded our, our expectations. And when we, when we brought this, you know, the people were a little, little nervous. You know, I was the, the real estate developer, which means, which I think equates to lying. You know, that somehow that's, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm like, no, I really think we can do this, so, you know. Um, <laughs> But we worked with, with lots of different fashions. And so there were 300 construction jobs that were created developing this building. All of those people needed to find food. And so there were people in the neighborhood that were providing food. Um, my other hat is in retail brokerage. And so we represent some of those food suppliers. And I know that they hired more people. And I know they have hired more people, especially since the building is, is opened. We hired people. Um, we worked with lead council. They trained them, they had them ready for us, and they were prepared to work. Um, and that was, that was critical to us. Uh, we didn't have to go through the whole interview process to find qualified people. They dropped them on our door. It's great, this is what we're looking for, and that was, that was excellent. Um, we also provided those resumes to others that were looking. And it, it, there's, the biggest thing is not only are there people working in the building, but it's a catalytic effect. Right? So with 1,100 people, I can tell you that the restaurants in the neighborhood had to hire more drivers and more people to make the sandwiches and more people to clean up and you know, so forth and so on. And, and we're actually looking to, I'd love to find a study to, to actually quantify exactly the, that effect. Um, but we know anecdotally it happens and we've interviewed lots of folks and, and we see that every day. Uh, we mentioned earlier, I mentioned earlier, there were some jobs, there were some incentives. Um, so 
both in terms of lead counsel doing training and, uh, and putting together this, this book of resumes, and that was backed by the city of Chicago, we also had this OCS grant. And so people are incentivized to hire people in the community um, and to hire people that are, uh, are not, I don't know what the term is, but uh, don't have gainful employment today. Um, and they're getting almost a $9,000 loan per person that they agree to hire over the next three years at a quarter of a percent right now. So you have to pay it back, but it's, it's essentially an interest-free loan. And so all of those things have really incentivized folks, and, and they're hiring. Um, and there's more. And so a lot of our tenants, um, we have a guy named Seneca Kearns, who's We Farm America. Um, he's also with Growing Home. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar. And Seneca is training people on how to do urban organic gardening. And so not only is he providing jobs, but he's providing education. Um, we had a conversation earlier about connecting with the land, about providing jobs, about understand, about eating healthier, all of those things, right? And we are now shining our light, because we have lots of social media around our project, around the good work he's doing. I mean, we're, we're providing the platform, but it's all the people in the building that are doing the good work. And we can say to the world, hey, by the way, look at what this guy does. You can do urban gardening right in your backyard, right in a box, literally, on your balcony, and create fresh produce, and it's local. And so from an environmental standpoint, there's no transportation. From a health standpoint, obvious. Cost, same thing. And, and people are learning. So there's all of these different kinds of things, and I can go through multiple examples, but that's, that's the, the general sense of what's happening in our project. I don't know if you can provide perspective on this next question because it may precede your involvement, but at the time when Cooper Lamps left, as you said, there was you know buildings all over the city being converted to condos, and I assume that the fact that the neighborhood in their quality of life plan had recognized that as a threat and said explicitly, we do not want that to happen to this building. We want it to stay as a job center. And the fact that they built these relationships was really key. Yes, um, it, it absolutely was key. And, and it's a testament to the fact that neighborhood groups can stand up and be active and um, work with their local aldermen to achieve the results they want to achieve. Um, now that said, it, in all of our work, on all of my work with Lit, with LISC, there also has to be a practical reality. Mm -hmm. um, when we go on these neighborhood tours, uh, we have to make sure that what what we're looking for and what what we can bring to the table makes makes sense. Um, and in this instance, it 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 was able to do that. Uh, we had a great build a great building with great bones, um, and with the proper financing, able to make make economic viability and make economic sense of this of this building. Um, so yes. Thank goodness, because it could have easily been a bunch of empty condos today. It really could have. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, Gloria, I'll go to you next. Um, earlier, India talked about the strategies to use anchor institutions to get minority-owned businesses and the low-income community patched into a supply line. I know you have a slightly different take, but can you talk about your efforts to work with <coughs> Chicagoland corporations to improve opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses? Sure. Um, and, and David, you're going to love this because we actually are working on some of uh, the data gathering that we'll, right. we'll talk about the job creation. Um, Chicago United is a unique organization because as advocates, we don't work in the public sector at all. We work specifically to shift the way corporations um, utilize minority talent, whether that's in their human resource area or the talent that comes in entrepreneurship. And what we've done is we've created a program that enlists senior level commitment to select five local minority firms that they will do business with for a period of five years so those firms can build scale, so they can plan and build scale, become more competitive, and, and as they become more competitive, they can actually gain additional corporate contracts. Well, what does that mean? In many cases, when we think about minority business, we think about the very small, micro, local minority businesses, which are fundamental to community health. At the same time, we need to think about minority-owned businesses that build scale and wealth in communities of color. And that's important because if, and I'll give you some examples, if you look at an organization like 
uh, aerial investments or uh, an investment banker like Loop Capital Markets. They hire, I mean, their offices are downtown, but they hire from community co of color all across the city. That means those individuals take their, their income back into their communities. They're the ones who are going to the local dry cleaner. They are, you know, again, as you've, as you've mentioned, you know, the local restaurants do better. The lo you know, the local uh, green grocers do better. So it's really important to have a balanced view of where minority businesses can be. They can be in the community, but they can also grow scale. The important part of building wealth through business is that they have a dramatic effect on education and arts. So you look at aerial investments, not only do they create jobs, but they also give back by supporting a charter school. You look at a company like Azteca Foods, not only do they create jobs, but they helped seed fund the Mexican American Fine Arts Museum. So building these minority firms to scale is, is really important. The challenge has been um, that there hasn't been an organization in Chicago who has reached out to the large corporations and indicated to them that they have a responsibility to do business locally. So they will take their minority business programs, and they're very proud of them, and they do a gr many of them do a really great job, but they weren't looking at what was happening at home. So they were spending their minority business dollars with companies in Dallas, and in Boston and Los Angeles, and those companies were build, building scale, becoming more competitive, and actually taking dollars out of the local community. And the way that we know that is because we surveyed, and we actually took the data from the survey of the 52 initial corporations that we reached out to to see where they were spending their money. And we learned that they, when they were spending money locally, they'd spend a dollar locally with a minority firm. It would turn into a dollar 84 of economic activity. So exactly as David said, you know, his, his uh, experience with it is you know, empirically true. So we looked at job creation directly, indirectly, and induced. So the direct jobs that were created by the corporate contracts, those that were created indirectly by the restaurant, and then that restaurant went ahead and spent additional dollars, so you had induced dollars. So you have successive rounds of spending, um, and that becomes incredibly important to local communities. So we've uh, built this program, Five Forward. We started with 13 corporations. There are now 28 large corporations committed, um, and we are in the process of producing our first economic impact report. So we'll actually be able to go back out into the community and support work like David's work, where we can say, David, actually, you can use our report to show how the direct jobs are created, the, the indirect jobs are created, and the induced jobs are created, and how that dollar moves through the economy to strengthen local communities. I know that report's not done yet, but not can you yet. share some of the results you are seeing? Um, at this point, we, I, I can't because we're still very much in the uh, data analysis stage. When the corporations commit <coughs> to Five Forward, one of the reasons why this is such a significant commitment, it's not just we're going to do business with some minority businesses for five years. They actually have to commit to entering into our secure website and, and uh, reporting their quarterly spend with their local firms. But what I can tell you kind of on an anecdotal basis is I've interviewed some of the local minority firms. We know that in the uh, economic downturn, um, these firms held stable in their relationships with the corporations that committed to them. So jobs were not lost by those corporations who were part of the Five Forward program. So that was a very significant finding. And in that process, we had some companies. Um, we had a, a corrugated box manufacturer who actually doubled the size of his warehouse and added a second shift. We had another firm that's a consulting firm that went from $80,000 a year in business to three years later, $8 million in business. So we know that when uh, the firms really dedicate to uh, a program like Five Forward, the impact can be significant. Not all the firms did as well as, as those examples, but many of them did. So we know that this is a model, um, and we're pulling out those best practices in addition to the actual uh, economic data. 
And then Mara, uh, follow-up question for your presentation. Um, so one of the strategies in the plan talks about utilizing the assets of the low-income communities. And I wanted, you alluded to a couple examples, but I want you to talk a little <coughs> more about that and then also specifically about how you see the strategies playing out to position the neighborhoods to connect to the regional opportunities. Yep. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, the uh, explicit in all 10 of the economic growth strategies for the region is this idea that we need to leverage all of the assets of the region. So. Um, you know, it's not just the big businesses or the headquarters, which is, you know, a piece of one of the strategies, but it's actually the latent human capital, it's the innovation, it's the small businesses working with our bigger businesses, it's the minority businesses working with bigger customers. Um, so it really does tie into all of that. Um, I would just emphasize a, a point that I made earlier, which is that um, fostering the right connections between and amongst our communities and neighborhoods is critical. So that's where, um, you know, there's a real interlink with for example, the infrastructure strategy, right? If you've got great human capital assets on the south side, but um, great jobs for those people on the north side, and it's a 90-minute commute, that's a problem, right? So, so fostering those connections. If you've got, you know, people with talent, people um, getting the right vocational training, but who don't have access to internet in their neighborhoods, that's a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. So making those connections is really, really critical, and I, I love the example of uh, Chicago United there. Um, and on, uh, tell me the second question again. Um, it was about <coughs> how you, the strategies to particularly position the community, so not just utilizing mm -hmm. their assets, but you kind of have answered it, but positioning them so that they can connect to the regional growth opportunities. Yeah, that's right. And so this is, um, this is where I'd, I'd emphasize, I mentioned on that last slide that you know, we're putting a real focus on actually implementing this plan. It's not just a set of 10 strategies that we talk about and we published and that was it. Um, we're actually setting up leadership teams uh, to track progress and launch and surface new ideas for each of the strategies across the region. And that's where uh, all communities need to be involved in being a part of each of those strategies. So again, a lot of the stuff that's happening um, led by people in this room around our communities already aligns directly with the strategies and we need to figure out ways to actually bring people to the table to talk to one another and to scale up some great ideas from you know one community to another. So if there's a an organization in this room doing this work in a low-income community, how would they participate and have voice in this next Yeah, stage? good question. So in the near term, you should probably reach out to me. We, we are, uh, in, in, even in the next few weeks, kind of solidifying leadership teams. And then we'll have a place where, you know, if you're really focused on innovation and entrepreneurship, there will be a leadership team that we can point to that, you know, community leaders can link in with. Um, for now, I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of business cards, so please do reach out to me. <laughs> um, okay, I want to actually now ask if anyone in the room would like to either ask a question of one of the panelists or share a comment or a thought. Erilyn? Yes, please. Okay, my question is for David. <coughs> David. Say, actually, introduce yourself and where oh, you're sorry. from. Sorry, Marilyn Ingwall. I'm from the Department of Housing and Economic Development, just down the street here. Um, uh, my question is for the Green Exchange. Now, I'm aware that the building itself received tax increment financing for the redevelopment, as well as Coyote Logistics received tax increment financing for their build out. Um, and I think some of the other job training dollars also may have been TIF funded as well or connected. Um, as the TIFs expire and they don't get renewed, where do you see another source for that gap financing to come out of? Because a lot of people don't talk about that they have a TIF project, but they do. And um, there'll be less of them, of course, as these expire. Right. Well, so in our case, um, we weren't getting any money up front. Ours is reimbursable. exactly reimbursable. So uh, it wasn't that we're using it in order to do CapEx projects. It was really an, an opportunity for us to uh, offer lower rents to incentivize companies to come. Um, I certainly share that concern, uh, but I've got some time to deal with that. And my expectation is that I will have created a project that has such value to its tenants and to the community um, that as those expire a decade from now, that they will have grown in terms in their in what in what they do, um, and that they'll be able to afford that that incremental rent that goes or that well I guess rent that goes away right, um, and that all will be good. Um, but I'm sort of kicking the can down the road, right? Right. For new projects, you know that that yeah. There there is no question. Um, it, there are lots of different potential pools of money. 
And but for these incentives, uh, my project, that project would not have gone. With no question about it, um, and and a number of projects. And so, uh, yeah, I I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, you know, I mean, I think the guys that uh, that were here this morning, they were they were our right, they were our answers. Um, <laughs> I, I guess I guess my hope and expectation is is that at some some level someone's going to figure it out. You know, if one expires, something else comes to the table to replace it because otherwise you're stagnant, right? And stagnation is not going to be helpful to anybody. Um, and so it's uh, sort of an economic will find its level um, and say, well, at some point, then prices have to drop. Um, and right, the number of plus of construction and reconstruction is going to go up. That's a lot. There's, there's no question. And it's a concern across all this work because the federal, state, and local resources are getting cut. No doubt. Uh, question back here. Uh, my name is Megan McShann. Um, I'm just here as a member of the public. And this question is, I guess, for Mara. Um, in your presentation about the plan for economic growth, you, you spoke about uh, prerequisites as far as you know, high performing schools and safe streets. Are there any concurrent strategy, strategies to ensure that those prerequisites are met as they go along with the other 10 strategies um, for the plan? Good question. So, so not explicitly, we did say, you know, there's so much big work happening around K to 12 education, around, you know, the anti-violence campaign in the city, around public health initiatives um, that we're going to, you know, say at the beginning that these initiatives and that work needs to be successful for economic growth to happen. But then again, we focused on those, you know, clear top line measures of economic growth specifically. Did you want to add something to that? Well, I, I did. Okay. Go and ahead. and I wanted to make sure that I, I, I guess I'm pitching the arts <laughs> greatly. Um, please make sure that you take a look at the Americas for the Arts and look at a new um, survey that they did about the economic impact of the arts. And I think it's very important because um, they have done uh, studies of cultural facilities and nonprofits, and what they found was $135 billion came back as revenue, and only $4 million was allotted for arts funding. And that's, that's tremendous. And even in the state of Illinois, um, we're talking the equivalent of, um, of 60,000 jobs just in Chicago alone. And these are arts-related jobs. So think about how you can go into these communities and be more supportive of what the arts can do as an asset. I've looked at... Um, different models that have worked. And one of the models that we, we've we implemented and we are continuing to do is this building communities through the arts. And that was started by LISC through the New Communities Program. And it was funded by the Joyce Foundation in which we targeted three communities. And we looked at the arts assets in those communities. It was Albany Park, Humble Park, and South Chicago. And when we looked at those three communities, they all worked and operated very differently. Albany Park, very dense community, but very cultural community. It had a lot of um, in, in, um, immig immig immigrants coming into the community. So you had that cultural diversity and that arts was very naturally there. They created, several years ago, they created a plan to do a sculpture garden for the community because it was so dense that this brought communities to come and see it. And now they're building um, gardens around the, around the, these, um, the sculpture garden. Um, jobs are being created for the artists. Jobs are being created through um, the restaurants that are in the community. When you look at Humble Park, Humble Park has a, a great coalition of artists that are right there. Those artists, they're able to create jobs 
just within the grassroots sector, which was just far amazing to me that, you know, they didn't, those are the type of artists, they're not going to apply for a grant but they're gonna find a way to make art sustainable in the community. And then they're also supplying jobs for our youth, who, which is a greatly needed resource for our youth. Start them off in the, in the arts, it gives them that creative mind once they go into the workforce as an adult. In South Chicago, very raw community, I've watched our artists grow from being one single artist to an artist that's growing into a business and creating a business for themselves. I have one artist, um, Kokomoka Arts, um, single artist, Derek, got really engaged and did a lot of, um, he took advantage of a lot of the capacity building that we put into the community for our artists. He's now opening up his business on our commercial district, and he's selling environmental um, um, clothing for the community. He's working also in the schools simultaneously. So there's this mentoring that's continuously happening. So those dollars are really circulating, and they're going around. I have an artist that teaches dance. She teaches dance for the little kids, and she's teaching the seniors. So when they're performing, they're performing all over the city of Chicago. That means that people are coming to see them perform. When they're rehearsing in our community, and there are 100 kids that are rehearsing for that program, who are they calling? They're calling that, like, that restaurant to say, I need five or 10 pizzas. So, that, so they're, gonna, they're gonna buy from that local restaurant, and they're gonna feed those kids. The kids are gonna perform. When they have that performance, after that performance, they're going to, the parents are gonna to wanna to go and they're gonna to wanna to spend their money right back in their community. So you have to think about how that dollar is gonna circulate when you bring the arts into the community also. Thanks. Joel, you had a question? Yes, Joel Bookman with LISC and the Institute. Question for David, actually. Um, the Green Exchange is a, an incredible facility that is, is really um, doing all the things you talked about. It's creating employment and energy and excitement and a focus on the environment and all that sort of thing. Um, and it's taken lots of energy and time and money and subsidy and resources. Um, is it replicable? Um, is it replicable in other places in Chicago um, or out, outside of Chicago, but I'm thinking also those neighborhoods around the city that maybe don't have a 280,000 square foot building and lots of TIF dollars. Is there a way to do this sort of thing on a more, uh, on a larger scale mm -hmm. or you, across you, other places? You stole my follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, we're, we're working on that now. Uh, we, we, I have a couple of different ideas. Uh, one, I, I don't know that Green Exchange necessarily works again in Chicago. I think it's a regional play. Um, I think it works in other regions and, and we're exploring that option. Um, I do think that it, um, another building around the arts and social entrepreneurship mm -hmm. um, and elements of the Green Exchange, so creating that community. Uh, our event space is uh, sort of the heart and soul along with the restaurant. And so I think taking that piece and surrounding it with social entrepreneurship, arts, um, still being green, mm -hmm. just not necessarily the focus. And by the way, you know, we tend to be that way anyways at Green Exchange, um, makes sense. And there are a couple of properties that we're looking at in Chicago and, uh, and exploring that. So yes, I mean, I, I think that um, the real issue is that it's been, the model has been validated. Um, what we thought was, look, you can office in, in any building, and what's the competitive advantage, right? You're really selling a commodity. It's different than retail. In retail, you know, one side of the street, this corner versus that corner, could be the difference in, you know, being in business and out. In office space, if, if the space is the same, quality-wise, then there really is no difference between this building and the one across the street. It's all about price, unless you're creating a community. And by community, let's expand that to a place where you share best practices, a place that you get referrals, a place that supports the social enterprise that you're involved with, um, a place that brings, I mean, we're, we're, uh, I was talking about organic gardening. We send out an email and we get more volunteers than we know what to do with. 
Um, so all of those things are helping to uh, expand these businesses and to make them successful. We have an architectural group that started off two point perspective. It was two architects and now they have eight and, they don't, and they're trying to figure out where to get more space and more people. And it's a majority of their business has come through the green exchange community, both in terms of stuff they've designed for other tenants, but in terms of their referrals. And that is an example that's um, emblematic of what has happened throughout. And I think that that same thing can happen. Um, I think when I initially talked about this you know, several years ago, we thought it could, now we know it does. Um, and that's a very different place. So yes, I think it can be replicable. Um, we are, we're in that process um, and we're talking to other folks about it and see what happens. Hopefully it doesn't, this one doesn't take seven years. <laughs> right. Jerry. Thank you. Jerry Boyle with the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And I'd like to ask Gloria specifically about the geography of the five forward program, because uh, we, back in the late nineties, we had an experience where there was an effort, Don Graves talked about a program called Business Link earlier this morning. There was an attempt to implement that here in Chicago. Um, and it was mistakenly interpreted as we really need to go into some of the hardest neighborhoods in the city and try to identify suppliers for essentially Fortune 500 companies. And we now know, based in part on what Teresa presented this morning, that when you target those communities, you're targeting communities whose businesses are undercapitalized and the infrastructure is poor and there are all kinds of challenges that really work against those businesses getting into the Fortune 500 supply chain. And then the other thing we heard this morning were instances like the Cleveland Clinic or the Cleveland Anchor Institution strategy. We've heard that in other places like the Johns Hopkins approach in Baltimore, where there's a geographic scope to where the institutions are located. Um, and there are certain benefits to that, um, but that's not what's happening with Five Ford. Five Ford really has a scattered set of participating purchasing institutions as well as a scattered set of suppliers that are now entering into that program. And that really gets to some of what we're trying to achieve with these panels, and that is how, how, do, we, how do we bridge those two things of being able to not ignore the, the needs of the, the communities in the city that could use to have some supplier diversity helping to build companies in those communities, but still be able to take advantage of the fact that we have as the economic development report, all these assets that we have available in the, in the region um, to be able to deploy some of those resources efficiently and effectively in these neighborhoods. And I think Five Forward begins to have a story to tell about that. Yeah, it is, uh, it's interesting. The, the business link model was one that we actually very carefully avoided. So we look at Five Forward, um, when we started it, we used the the closest six counties. Um, and the corporations are all headquartered in those counties, and we ask them to use minority firms within, within that, that smaller segment of the region. The difference between our approach and prior approaches where you went in by zip code and said, this is a really poor zip code, let's find somebody to do business with in this zip code, is that business doesn't operate that way. The corporations are there to produce their goods and services, to sell to consumers, and, and to make a profit. They're really not there to, to find somebody in a low-income zip code and, and support them. So what we did was we stepped back and said, what we want you to do is make a commitment to look in your business for areas of opportunity that are sustainable. And then we will help match you to a local business within the, the six counties who can meet your needs. Now, they may not be able to meet all of your needs today, but over that five-year period, they can start to grow into meeting your needs. And the key is to become a strategic partner. The way most minority firms are viewed, and particularly when you try to do something like a business link, is it's transactional. Well, when I find an opportunity and I need a pen, I'll, I'll buy that one from you. Well, nobody can build a business on when I find an opportunity, maybe I'll buy something from you. So making that commitment by first really looking strategically within their own needs, identifying the opportunity, and committing that opportunity 
and doing it in a way that helps that firm to build capacity, not just by the revenues, but actually by that strategic relationship. So for example, we had one, one uh, uh, and, and you're right, there are all different kinds of companies that are engaged in Five Forward. We have headquartered companies like McDonald's and Kraft, but we also have company, uh, uh, large organizations like Advocate Healthcare. In case of Advocate Healthcare, one of their vendors, it became very clear that they didn't have strong infrastructure. Their, so Advocate's accounting department actually went in and said, let us help you refine your processes your internal accounting processes. We're gonna actually help you with your invoicing pro processes, your collection. So they actually strengthened this firm in their accounting area. And with that same firm, uh, Advocates Legal Department went in and said, your contracts are actually not strong enough. We can wiggle out of this contract tomorrow if we want to. We need to help you strengthen your contract so that you actually, when you go in and you build a relationship with a company, you know what you're going to get, they know what they're going to get, and you actually now have a stronger relationship. So our approach is fundamentally different because what we're looking at, what, we, what we've said to the corporations is, you're gonna spend that money anyway. You're gonna buy boxes, you're going to use an accounting firm to do your, your personnel audits, your benefit audits. You're going to spend that money anyway. But if you spend that money here in Chicago with a local minority firm, not only will you help the local economy, but you actually start to build the human capital in the region. Because as the professionals within those minority firms grow in their own professional development, that human capital becomes fluid between minority firms and large corporations. So there's actually a long-term benefit to the local corporations because not only have they now built a stronger relationship with a minority firm who has now become competitive as in competing for larger contracts across the region and across the nation, but they've actually started to enhance the local um, environment for human capital and building a professional base of employees. So it has a, a really fundamentally different approach. Um, and I think that's partially because we come from an environment, Chicago United is, um, was founded by CEOs who said, we need to take personal responsibility for the local community in which we do business. And we remain true to that. So we don't have public funding for this. This is all corporations understanding what it means to have a strong local economy and what that does for their business. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. Um, this is directed to Ms. Mara. Um, I'm interested in finding out. Is your microphone closed? Oh, sorry. Thank you. I'm interested in finding out um, about what are some of the physical infrastructure pillars that are present and viable either now near term in 2012 that makes Chicago ripe for economic growth and jobs. And my premise is that my father always said that private money <coughs> follows public money. And so those physical infrastructure pillars that are here uh, in Chicago uh, and the plan, because I did read the bio about your involvement in the infrastructure initiative here in Chicago, if you could just share what makes Chicago ripe physically for economic growth and jobs. Sure. So. Um I hope, I, I hope I'm answering your question right. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, the Infrastructure Trust, which was recently launched uh, by the city. Um, it's one of, I think, many uh, potential ways to more innovatively finance big infrastructure investments in the region that are critically needed, right? So the first project gives one example of, uh, of what that might look like, which is around uh, energy efficiency retrofitting all the buildings in the city. So it provides you know, direct cost savings that then goes back and kind of pays for the investment. Um, other potential uh, investments around this could be things like bus rapid transit, right? And there's a lot of work happening today around bus rapid transit to actually more efficiently connect human capital to where the jobs are um, and more efficiently connect, you know, people and ideas in a lot of other ways as well. Um, uh, I, could, I could list other examples. I'm not sure if I'm answering that, the question right though. Okay, great. Yeah, so there, there are examples like that. There are um, examples around... Uh, you know, if we think broadly about what does it mean to be a transformative investment, really, and this is, I'll, I'll pull from the Brookings language, so Bob should correct me if I, if I say it wrong here, but, um, you know, a transformative investment in infrastructure is one that 
sets up the regional economy to be more competitive in the 21st century global economy. And the 21st century economy is knowledge-based, idea-based, right? It's much more global, and very importantly, it's much more dynamic. So ideas kind of turn over, and new ideas uh, and new clusters form. All these things happen in a much more uh, rapid way than historically in our economy. So any investment that can help accelerate that um, is a transformative infrastructure investment. So back to the digital example, there's a lot of opportunity to uh, improve access to broadband and, and wireless internet in neighborhoods that don't have great access to that. And what that does is actually accelerate the, uh, the turnover of ideas and connect people um, and firms in, in ways that are much more dynamic and rapid, which is what it takes to be successful, as another example. Chris? Hi, my name is Chris Walker, and I'm with Lisk in Washington, D.C., and I have a question for Ms. Samuel. Um, Ms. Lee, earlier on the, on the earlier panel, had talked about the role of cultural and educational institutions in doing one kind of community development, economic development, I should say, through largely through purchasing and other kinds of activities. But I'm very interested in the way in which major cultural institutions can support the kind of economic development that you do, which is in communities, in neighborhoods, and supportive of what Ms. Dr. Jackson would have called generative activity. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for your question. I think one of the things that um, uh, Mr. Graves said earlier is about that the whole idea of collaborations, I find a very big um, value in that I've seen a lot of um, smaller organizations grow when the larger organizations take them in and help them grow. Um, it, you know, this is really a new way of looking at the arts and how it operates and how it can be successful. We're trying many different things because I hate to say this about our country, but we really don't embrace the arts like other other countries do, and it makes it very difficult for um, people like myself to, to help smaller entities. So it's those collaborations that are very key. Um, I know that there's a, um, I remember watching one organization, it's a theater company called Impact Theater, and I remember, fortunately, one of the, the um, groups that nurtured them was the Park District, and the Park District allowed the theater company to house in the 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 um the field house and they bartered. So they didn't have money for rent, but they had the talent to teach the classes and there's a monetary value to that. And so they taught those classes and as the money started coming in from doing their main productions, then they were able to invest in better space and they were able to rent space. So then they started renting space from Victory Gardens Theater. Well, Victory Gardens Theater, what did they do? They expanded and they had their own, their own theater space. Well, now Impact is now in the old Victory Gardens space. So it's those, those type of collaborations are just very important you know, in order for arts to move forward. Any other questions, Howard? I'm sorry. We had two businesses um, that were working with Fortune 100 companies. One was with Chrysler, and the other was with Eaton Corporation out of Cleveland. Um, and uh, Eaton was customer was the Navy, and we just spent months and months and months and months working with with small businesses that had to go up here in order to qualify for contracts with a subcontractor for the United States Navy. It wasn't impossible, but it was really hard. And we found that the businesses that we were working with weren't doing their business because they were spending all their time becoming certified for government work. The, we were more successful with Chrysler, but she probably spent two years, an African-American owned woman business, probably spent two years becoming certified for Chrysler, and that's all she did. It's all she did. I constantly, you know, traveling between Milwaukee and Detroit and ordered, and she finally got work, but I don't know that it was worth it in the long run. So my question to you is, 
how have you overcome that problem with your clients or customers? And did you find the same kind of a problem? And what kind of outcomes are you getting? It, the, the problem you describe of um, the desire to become a prime contractor to a very, very large corporation is it can be a double-edged sword. Because if you are very successful, you can do extremely well. But the investment to get there is going to be large no matter, no matter what. There really isn't any way around that. Those companies, uh, whether you're talking about a Chrysler or you're talking about you know, a Baxter, their level of um, excellence that must be achieved because you, you can't have a failed break, right? So if you're making a part that's going to go into breaks, you can't have a failed break. So they're going to take two years in a vetting process. The pro where we came where we came into this was, let us take some of your current vendors and let's start to create a strategic plan to advance them in your current business. So it may be that they are making a particular part today, and their five-year plan includes now moving them from part number one to part number one and two, and part number one, two, and three. So it's a much slower process. You're not going to catapult from being a kind of a, 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 a small partner to suddenly becoming a major vendor to a, a prime contractor. Ours is a much slower, more deliberate process. But it builds into it an upfront uh, commitment and a strategic plan over a period of five years. So that's how we that's how we addressed it. So you don't start out with the big contract. You start out with a smaller or medium sized contract, but a strategic plan over a period of five years that grows scale. And that also helps those those firms because if you jump into a huge contract, the the internal infrastructure is often tested. And you want to be careful not to put yourself in a position where you're failing. And so that's, that was the other part of where we came into, let's make this a long-term <coughs> considered growth pattern, um, because it, it decreased the pen potential for um, failure. And then the other place that we intersect is every six months, we actually survey each one of the corporations and each one of the minority partners for satisfaction levels. And so we start to look for the places where something might disconnect. So the minority firm might think, um, gee, I'm doing a really, really great job, and we're on time delivery, and we're doing really well. And then we get a report from the corporation that says, they're doing good. And so there might be a little disconnect that we, that we actually intercede then and help them make sure that they are both seeing the same picture. Um, because that's part of that five-year advancement process. But that's, that's the approach that we took, we, because the situation you described is particularly difficult. Okay, I think we could do one more question and then a wrap-up. Hi, uh, Dory Rand, excuse me, from Woodstock Institute. I have a question for Marwa. Um, I was wondering, um, in connection with the, the mayor's economic plan and the part that would support neighborhood arts and culture as part of economic development. Mm -hmm. um, I know Jackie referred to some of the new data out there about the positive economic impact and jobs impact of arts and culture nonprofits in Illinois. But I also know that most small nonprofits don't really have the capacity to collect and analyze that kind of data. And I wondered if, if, if the mayor's plan is looking at ways to <coughs> help the arts and culture nonprofits be more savvy with the kind of data collection that's going to be necessary to document those successes and progress over time? That's a great question. So, so my short answer is um, not so much in the near term, but what we hope uh, this set of pretty you know, straightforward strategies will do is to kind of foster new ways of collecting that data and, and centralize things like that. So, um, <clears throat> so for example, around the tourism and entertainment focus strategy, a lot of that is around, of course, arts and culture. And so there's a ton of uh, uh, thinking already around collaborating directly with the city's cultural plan and cultural hubs and understanding the economic impact more explicitly, um, the economic impact of our cultural hubs on our tourism uh, industry more broadly. Um, so some of that thinking is happening. 
Uh, but I would also just uh, underscore a lot of the stuff that Jackie has said um, in that you know, arts and culture is important for a lot of different reasons for our communities, but there is this very direct economic impact of growing you know, our, our tourism and entertainment sector, but then a ton of indirect uh, benefit. And even you know, way back from the perspective of uh, big corporations and headquarters that like to move to Chicago, right? You've seen announcements all the time about these things now. Um, almost always the reason that companies and also people, talented people, move to Chicago is the quality of life. And a huge driver of the quality of life is, of course, our art, arts and culture in our neighborhoods. So, you know, just to underscore that point as well. Okay. okay, one more for Jerry. <laughs> Sorry, I, I actually wanted to ask this question earlier, David, and it, I think it goes in part to Joel's question about rep replicability, but yours was about re replicating the project. I'm going to cheat a little bit here because I was able to take a tour yesterday, which was absolutely fascinating, but I have to ask you, you describe yourself as a developer, but for people to call you a developer with that project understates your role pretty greatly. In some ways, because of the nature of what you do for the tenants with the space that you're creating, you're investing in the tenants, but you're not a venture capitalist because you don't take a piece of the business. In some ways, you're incubating, but you're not an incubator because you're not intervening in the management of any of these companies or really providing that kind of assistance. So I guess as a, as a means of getting to the question of whether or not this can be replicated, I have to ask the question, who are you? <laughs> Just with regards to the project. It's taken 46 years, I still don't know. Um, <laughs> trying to figure that out. Yeah, um, well, so we, we call ourselves a triple lot bottom line developer. So uh, here, here, here's the bigger, bigger thing. Um, I think in order to do the good work that I want to do, you have to have some means. And I, I think capitalism is an important part of that. Uh, and I, and I I think I get that. Um, that said, if I have my druthers, I, I'm a social entrepreneur. And yet, I'm not qualified to do a lot of the good work that you all do. I'm just not. Um, I recognize that. And I'm, and I'm saying, OK, so where's, where is my skill set? And my, my strongest skill set is in uh, retail brokerage and development. And so if I want to run a social enterprise, the best thing that I can do is actually produce the venue, right? As someone that represents retailers, we counsel them, we advise them as to where to go, why to go there, um, understanding demographic, psychographics, kind of same, same as Lamont. And, um, and as developers, we're putting together that venue and w how are you going to be uh, as efficient and productive as possible? And so we're, we're bringing all those folks together. So we're providing the, the platform and while I appreciate the, the compliments, and, and sometimes I, I, I'm acting in that role, um, it really becomes, I become less and less, as a, less of a factor every day as the community takes part and they come together and do it for themselves, right? And I'm just lucky enough to be part of it. But they are referring business to one another, they are teaching one another, they're teaching me. You know, again, I'm just a, I'm a, I'm a piece of the puzzle, I'm not, it's not like hub and spoke. Um, so. I think that the, the model has been established. Um, again, it was a collaboration of dozens, if not hundreds, uh, not necessarily me. And I think that that can be replicated. I'd certainly like to play a role in it. Um, but it doesn't revolve around me, that's for certain. Um, I think that uh, this model can be, you know, it's, it's coming together. Um, it's providing a good venue. It's people helping one another, best practices, referrals. Um, how, do we, how do we build a better mousetrap? That's it. OK, so I told Jim Caparo I'm going to borrow from his wrap up. He asked the first panel what marching orders they would give to all of us engaged in this work. I'm going to reiterate those very quickly. And then I'm going to ask the Chicago panelists if any of you have anything you would like to add to that. So what we heard this morning was seize the moment. There's interest right now in really doing this work that breaks down silos and integrates the work. Focus on the trends that will drive economic growth, like foreign nationals who want to immigrate to the US, tourism, energy efficiency. Bring partners to the table and align resources. Uh, focus on language. So this really is intentionally about alleviating poverty in low-income communities, not just moving it. And um, Don Graves ended with be fearless. So David, you get to go first. Boy. Would you like to add anything to that? 
I would if I could come up with something intelligent to say. Um, I, I think it's swing the bat, which is, um, you know, when I was in school it's a long time ago, I, I still have friends today that it's the woulda, coulda, shoulda. And, you know, when you get to my age and you've got kids and a dog and a mortgage, and if you haven't done it already, it makes it very difficult. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I find myself talking to lots of younger, younger people these days, and my answer is swing the bat. Get up there, you know, if it's a two flat or whatever company or whatever venture, when you're young and you don't have all of those responsibilities, is the time to do it. And your, the, the worst thing is you can make a mistake and learn from it. Great, Gloria? Um, I'd say ask the question. When you're talking with a corporate executive, when you're talking with somebody at a large foundation, when you're talking with somebody who has control of um, spending streams, ask the question, who are you doing business with locally? How are you supporting, supporting local vendors? Are you using your, a local accountant? Are you using a local <coughs> law firm? Are you using um, a, you know, a local green vendor? So ask the question, because the more often you ask the question, the more heightened the need for the responsibility. Great. Jackie? Invite an artist to your table. <laughs> I knew you were going to tell you. Very good. Please invite an artist. You'll have um, out of the box thinking, the creative mind at the table that can really assist and help you and think about some of the issues that we're going through. Collaborate with an arts organization, mentor them, help them build capacity so that they can grow and help build the economy. Thanks. And I'll. Um, just uh, offer a personal reflection, I guess, uh, reacting to all of those comments and a lot of the discussion today, which is um, since I started this work in Chicago quite a while ago now, um, the one thing that struck me the most is that there is just an incredible volume of amazing work happening around this region, um, arguably you know, overwhelmingly so in some areas and probably more than in any other metro area in the country. And so the opportunity to really foster new collaborations, come together, accelerate, scale up similar efforts, and really align on you know, a set of clear goals is immense and really exciting. Great. Well, please join me in thanking Marwa, Jackie, Gloria, and David. Thank and that concludes uh, today's seminar. Thank you all for coming. I do.